Are there any questions before we get started? If not, I think last time we finished up talking about the um, the, the ballistics problem. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we concluded that. And so today I want to talk about another type of perturbation problem or uh, a problem that involves a small parameter. In the last problem, the problem of uh, calculating those trajectories, the small parameter came at a certain location in the ordinary differential equation such that when the small parameter was zero, which is kind of what we call the limiting case, what resulted was a problem that we could still solve. In other words, it was still a second order uh, ordinary differential equation actually became linear, but we still had two boundary conditions it was still, or actually two initial conditions, and it was still a second order problem that we could solve. The difference with what we're gonna talk about now with these singular perturbation problems is that whenever we set the small parameter equal to zero, that is the limiting case, we get a problem where we degenerate from a second order problem down to something of lower order, and we can no longer solve the problem in a typical way. So here's the problem that I want to consider. <clears throat> so this linear ordinary differential equation coupled with these boundary conditions. As before, epsilon is a small parameter, which is positive. But in the limiting case, notice what happens. Whenever epsilon, now epsilon can't be equal to zero, we're restricting that, but we try to think about epsilon equals zero as some sort of um, base case or limiting case. So whenever epsilon is equal to zero, this term goes away. This epsilon goes away in here, but I still retain this first order derivative. However, the second order derivative term is completely gone. So something bad happens. Essentially something which is analogous to the problems that we studied before. Remember when we were studying problems like this, I think we actually did one which was cubic. And I don't know where the other term was, but if we solve a problem like this, let's actually add a lower order term, which is not just one. So a problem like this, where we actually lose roots whenever we set epsilon equals to zero, we go from having a problem that has three real roots to a problem with only one real root, or th at least three complex roots and one to one with has, which has one complex root in general. So it's analogous, this current situation is analogous to this situation of algebraic equations where we lose this higher order term. So what do we do in that case? Well, we have to be very careful because the uh, regular perturbation theory that we developed for the other algebraic equations and the previous ordinary differential equation problem has to be modified. So we're interested again in this problem whenever we have small values of epsilon, not equal, not epsilon equals zero, but very small positive values with for, for epsilon. Again, the limiting case would be a problem like that, which has no solution in general. It may have a solution, but in general is not going to have a solution. The reason is because if we have a differential equation of first order, it's not necessarily possible that we can satisfy boundary two separate boundary conditions. Um, in fact, in this case, you can see that the true solution for this limiting case problem, if I solve the equation first, we're gonna get some sort of uh, solution like this. We can satisfy one or other of the boundary conditions, but we can't satisfy both. For example, if we choose to satisfy this boundary condition, then we get a solution which looks like this. Something which decays as X gets larger and larger, and it passes through the value one or X equals one. <clears throat> 
that clearly cannot satisfy the boundary condition over here if we demand that the value of the solution is equal to zero. You could get very, very lucky, and this problem could have a solution if you just so happen to pick the values so that choosing the right uh, coefficient to give you one of the two boundary values gives you the other boundary value for free. But in general, that's not going to be possible. You only have one degree of freedom to adjust to accommodate two separate boundary conditions. Now, this could be turned into or considered with the case of an initial value problem where you have two initial conditions. And again, you would fail to be able to satisfy those in general. <clears throat> now, what's nice about this problem is it actually has an exact solution that we can find that is going back to this original non-perturbed problem. It has a solution. And that makes sense because this is a linear second order constant coefficient problem. So we can come up with a general homogeneous solution and then use that to satisfy and use the, the fact that we'll have two free parameters in that solution to satisfy the two boundary conditions. So we can actually find out what that solution is and it's given by this formula. Notice that it satisfies the boundary conditions clearly. Whenever x is equal to one, I have e to the minus x over e to the minus one over epsilon, or sorry, e to the minus x minus e to the one over epsilon, minus one over epsilon, and that exactly cancels what's in the denominator. And if I set x equals to zero, I'll get zero. So you can check that other one. Um, and by the way, so before I forget, let me point out that I have updated these slides on Canvas, so you can go grab those now. I'm, I'm working from the second slide deck for chapter one, and I hope to finish this slide deck today. I've also updated the lecture notes. The lecture notes tend to be a little more comprehensive and readable than the slides do. It's just the way I've been working. I'm trying to add stuff to the slides, and then I think about 10 different things I want to add to the notes. It's a hell of a moving target, so try to pay close attention to the changes, and don't ever print these things out because you'll get burnt. Now, I will tell you what it will tend to happen is as we make our way through something, it'll tend to settle down. So as I get through chapter one, the slides and the lecture notes should settle down. However, just going to be honest with you, I may get to chapter three and decide, oh, I want to add this to chapter one. That would be really cool. So uh, it's a moving target. And uh, this is the first time I've taught this course. So to sort of uh, um, make it more worth your while, we're going to be a little less formal about homework assignments and things like that. And I want you to help me uh, pay attention to things like do, do the notes make sense? And if they don't make sense, it might not be because you're stupid, it might be because I'm stupid or wrote something really, really silly. So please uh, bring any typos and errors and things that you find hard to read or hard to understand to my attention, and I'll try to get those fixed. There are still plenty of typos. So um, thank you for, to those of you who found typos so far, um, uh, keep them coming. Keep the reports coming, not the typos. All right, so here are plots of the solutions um, for various choices of epsilon. So epsilon is the value that I'm putting over here. Um, and they're plotted in comparison to this function, which is the exponential function of one minus x. So that's the solution actually that you get by solving the limiting case where you use the right-hand boundary condition, but not the left-hand boundary condition. So we notice an interesting thing happening. As epsilon is getting smaller, you're getting smaller as you go down, then these curves are looking a lot more like this base case or this limiting case, but then they have to take a real detour as it gets closer to x equals zero approaching from above. So let's take this, uh, this particular case um, as an example. Suppose epsilon is equal to 0 
that's not all that small. Um, small, but not all that small. So we get a solution which basically hugs this curve going all the way up. And then finally, it dives down at the end down to zero. So this is what we call a boundary layer. The solution is having to correct the final second as we're approaching x. The This is x equals zero down here. From the right, it has to dive down very steeply in order to satisfy that boundary condition. And this, the degree to which it's steep, gets uh, bigger and bigger, or the slope gets larger and larger as epsilon gets smaller and smaller. Okay, so such a solution is called a boundary layer. And it came, the, the, the name came out of uh, fluid dynamics, where you would have conditions like a no slip fluid flow condition at a boundary, but a very, uh, a fluid which didn't have much viscosity. And so what they noticed was when they did the theory and what they would notice when they looked at um, experiments is that the fluid might be moving very rapidly in this in this regime. So suppose this is velocity along this axis and this is position along this axis. Here near a place where there's no slip boundary conditions or no fluid flow boundary conditions, if the viscosity goes way down or dips way down, then you can get one of these layers where the velocity is very high here, but it has to transition to something very small in a very rapid amount of time. And this is what they call a boundary layer. So this doesn't have to be or apply to uh, fluid flow or things like that. Uh, these boundary layer phenomena appear all over the place. And I'll show you one application of that to um, a, an inter interface problem in uh, statistical mechanics and, and, and thermodynamics in, in mo momentarily. These are all over the place in, in biological models, physical models, um, interface problems, and things like that. All right, so as I said, this phenomenon, this object that's being created by this solution at the point x equals zero is what we call a boundary layer. The slope at x equals zero as epsilon gets smaller and smaller is approaching infinity as epsilon goes to zero. All right, so what we wanna do with this, with our perturbation theory is, or our asymptotic analysis is, how can we come up with a solution to this problem? How can we, well, an approximate solution. Well, the first thing you should do is object to coming up with an approximate solution for this problem. And why would we, why would you object to that? Because there's an exact solution. There's an exact solution. Why should you mess around with an approximate solution when you have an exact solution? Um, well, there are harder problems, harder versions of this, which uh, are nonlinear in nature. This problem happens to be a linear problem and has an exact solution. And so what we're going to do is pretend we don't know how to solve this problem exactly and uh, see if we can learn anything from it. Okay, so the way this problem goes is away from the boundary layer, things look kind of normal. In the boundary layer, things are happening rapidly and weird things are happening, okay? So what we're gonna do is kind of separate this problem into two zones, the boundary layer. And in the boundary layer, we're going to describe our approximate solution as the inner solution or the inner approximation. Outside or away from the boundary layer, we're going to construct a solution that we're gonna call the outer solution. So we're gonna have an inner, which is gonna be applicable in the boundary layer and an outer solution, which is gonna be applicable away from the boundary layer, okay? Where things are more pedestrian, well-behaved, mundane, okay? So certainly this solution is has a mundane region and then a kind of loud, radical, crazy region where things rapidly transition in a small amount of time where hard things are happening and we have to really understand them. So the way we're gonna handle this is, first of all, identify where the boundary layer is. And then stay the hell away from it for a while. 
Okay. So find out where it is and then stay away from it. So the boundary layer is around X equals zero. So as long as we're away from X equals zero, we're in the outer solution region. So let's suppose that we're operating away from X equals zero. And let's try to solve this problem using a perturbation technique. The same technique that we use when we tried to solve algebraic equations. Well, what we did in that case was we proposed an outer solution or we proposed a perturbative solution or perturbative expansion for our solution. That's what we did in the algebraic case. We're going to do the same thing here in this uh, differential equations problem. So suppose that we have a solution which can be expanded in powers of epsilon because we have a small parameter epsilon which appears in our problem. Now, there are some things we need to pay attention to. Number one is, is such an expansion possible? Okay. Number two, is it right to do the expansion in powers of epsilon or should we do it in powers of epsilon to the one half power or epsilon to the one third power or maybe even epsilon squared? Well, the way this usually goes is, well, you just kind of have to try some things and see if you get the right answer. If you get something which points to a contradiction, then you probably ought to back up and start again. It turns out in this case that the right expansion is in terms of powers, directly in powers of epsilon. And I'll show you later on how you determine what is the right expansion. Yeah. Is there any significance of the indexing of the expansion? Besides maybe the notion that these are different functions. Like why do I Yeah, is there any like significance to it besides the fact that you should know here as a different function? Uh so uh I don't know. So um so first of all, why do I use the index zero? So this is the this is the one multiplying epsilon zero. These are definitely going to be different, just like the terms of a power series. And so, so instead of using a zero, a one. These guys depend on X, and so I'm going to let those be. I'm going to let that take care of the variation with respect to X. Okay, so now I could do different types of expansions, right? I don't have to do an expansion like this. In fact, so we're going to come up with a name or have a, a spe specific name for an expansion like this. The first thing we do is come up with this thing called an asymptotic sequence. Okay, so we decide what sort of sequence of functions do we want to expand in? Well, we decide here to use one epsilon, epsilon squared, epsilon cubed, and that's the sequence we're going to use. We could use a different sequence based on different um, a different scenario or situation. So we have to figure out, in general, when we're doing applications like this, what's the best sequence to use? Should you use something else? Um, what's the guiding principle? So in our chapter one, where we're trying to do motivating themes, we don't explain all this, and we hope to tie that, or we hope to come back to that and make a more complete picture of what, what one should do later on. The bottom line is, however, that you don't always know. You, you, you may not know, and you may simply have to guess, build a solution, and then see if it makes sense, if you can get something which is not leading to a contradiction out in the end. So we're going to do this expansion, something to try, and we're going to insert that directly into the differential equation, and then we're going to equate the light powers of epsilon or the terms of light powers of epsilon. So what happens if I just dump this guy into this uh, this expansion into this equation? We get a series or a sequence of problems coming out. Now. Formally, all you do is we're going to take the second derivative of this. And so we we assume we can take the derivative term by term. This is an infinite sequence here, or infinite series. So we're going to assume we can do all of these and all the manipulations make sense, but we're not going to prove that they make sense in the strict analysis uh, way. So suppose I can take second derivatives and then multiply each by uh, epsilon second derivatives of each one of these terms and then multiply by an extra epsilon. So I get y double prime, y zero double prime times epsilon, y one double prime times epsilon squared, and so on. So that takes care of this first term. Second term, I can break this up into two terms and do the one first and the epsilon second. So let's do that. So we just take one derivative, no additional epsilon gets multiplied. 
The second term owing to this guy here gets an extra epsilon in every position, right? So you multiply by epsilon. You assume that you assume that you can do this term by term without any suffering any consequences. And finally, I have this term, and that just writes out directly from the expansion. Now, what I mean when I say I want to equate uh, coefficients of like powers of epsilon, we're going to take the lowest order power of epsilon and start looking for other terms that have that same uh, power. And then we're going to set it equal to the right or appropriate coefficients on the left-hand side. We're going to interpret the left-hand side as being 0 times 1 plus 0 times epsilon plus 0 times epsilon squared and so on, dot, dot, dot. So we can kind of forget about zero and think about it. zero as expanded in the same sequence that we have on the on the right hand side. So what is the first equation that we're going to encounter going to be like or going to indicate? Well, it's going to be y zero prime plus y zero equals zero. And if we look for the terms that multiply epsilon, then we get y zero double prime y plus y1 prime plus y0 prime plus y1 prime equals zero. Okay, so these equations uh, can be represented like this. So the way I like to write it is we're going to consider all the terms or all the coefficients of the terms where we have epsilon uh, to the zero power, or in other words, one. And we're going to equate all those across uh, both sides of that equation. And so the first equation I get is this. And this is what we call the leading order equation. Now, usually the leading order equation is the order um, epsilon zero term. But sometimes, and later on, you're going to get good at doing expansions like this, and you might start your expansion out as the epsilon to the minus two term, okay? So the leading order might be epsilon minus two or epsilon minus three. In this case, based on the onsatz that we're using, the assumption about the power series we're using, the leading order equation is the epsilon to the zero power equation. So whichever one comes first, that's your leading order. And then your first correction is going to be the next one, and the second correction is going to be the next one. So here are the equations we get out. Um, or here are the, uh, yeah, the equations we get. So y0 prime plus y0 equals 0. And we can solve this. The, but, but the question is, we can find a general solution of this, but what boundary condition we, should, we, should we use in order to, to fully uh, determine the, the unknown coefficients, which, which is going to appear? Well, remember, we said we're going to stay away from the boundary layer. So that means we're going to ignore the boundary layer for now and simply focus our attention on the other boundary condition away from the boundary layer. This problem is nice. It has one boundary layer located next to the boundary, the left-hand boundary, and one, and, 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 and so I should have said that wrong. So it has one boundary layer associated to x equals zero. And at x equals one, we don't have a boundary layer. We're good. So how, we, how would we know that in general without knowing the solution? Well, that's there's an art to that, which we'll talk about in chapter three. But for now, we're going to use the boundary condition at x equals, at x equals one. So that boundary condition is expressed like this. The outer solution should satisfy the boundary condition at x equals one. But remember, we said we have an expansion for the outer solution like this. So the way we figure out boundary conditions is now we're going to treat this as 1 plus 0 times epsilon plus 0 times epsilon squared, et cetera. And then we're going to again equate uh, the coefficients of like powers of epsilon, which gives us these boundary conditions. Y0 of 1 is equal to 1, and all others, Y1 of 1, Y2 of 1, Y3 of 1, are all equal to 0 identically. But that means we can solve this sequence of equations exactly, and we can get a solution out. So this first equation has the solution y0 equals e to the x, or sorry, e to the 1 minus x. 
What solution is that? Well, that was that red solution that we showed in this equation. That's that guy right there. Okay, so that's what's happening in this region far from the boundary layer. Things are behaving nicely and I simply get a pedestrian solution uh, e to the one minus x. Well, that's just for the leading order. What do I get for the first order correction? Re remember, because I've got a power series expansion in epsilon to describe my solution. The first order solution turns out to just be y1 equals zero. And that's because, it, well, if you solve it, you find out you're getting zero. So we solve for zero, or we solve for this equation using the fact that we know this solution now, it's just e to the one minus x. So you put that in, you get a homogeneous solution and you get a particular solution. I'll let you do the calculation. And then we have to satisfy a boundary condition. All right, if you do that, then you find out the solution to the correction problem is exactly y1 is equal to zero. Guess what? The same thing happens for y2. y2 equals zero and y3 equals zero. So the outer solution is a very simple thing. It's just equal to e to the one minus x. If you like, you can also say, okay, plus zero times epsilon plus zero times epsilon squared plus zero times epsilon cubed, and you get the idea. But interestingly, this outer solution doesn't seem to depend on epsilon at all, right? The outer solution doesn't care what epsilon is. It's not paying attention to epsilon. Okay, so that's our outer solution or our outer approximation. So what we did was we used what we call or inserted what we call a regular perturbation or regular expansion directly into the equation. We ignored what's happening in the boundary layer. We focused on the other boundary. We applied that boundary condition and we tried to find out what these functions have to be in this power series expansion. Okay, so that makes sense, right? And the nice thing about this outer solution is it's a simpler problem to solve, right? I have a first order equation or a reduced order equation, and I apply one of the boundary conditions or a lesser number of boundary conditions. So the outer problem is usually, uh, I can't think of any cases where it's not, much simpler to solve than the original ODE to begin with. So a lot of times you can solve this analytically very quickly as, as here. So here's our solution. If we solve the outer problem, the next thing we do is turn our attention to the inner problem and see if we can make any, any uh, headway with that problem. For the inner, uh, solution or the inner approximation, we have to use some techniques that we've already learned when we dealt with the algebraic problems. Whenever we dealt with the algebraic problems and we had a higher order term which disappeared on us, we had to make a change of variables. Remember our rule, ABC, always be changing variables, ABCD. So think about changing variables. What we're going to do in the inner problem is we're going to change to a new variable where instead of experience a rapid, experiencing a rapid change in solution in some variable, as in the x variable, we change to a new variable where the solution to the problem is not changing rapidly at all. Okay. We have to determine what, what variable that would be. What, what, to what variable should we change? And, um, how do we find out or determine what that should be? Okay, so the variable to which we're going to change is going to be called z. z equals uh, epsilon to the alpha power times x. And then we're going to try to determine what alpha should be. This is what we call the stretched variable of the problem. 
the stretch variable is going to be applicable or used in the boundary layer, but not in the outer layer. We're going to define a new function called capital Y. So this is, again, an analogy with what we did in the case of the uh, algebraic problems. We changed to a new variable, which we called Y from the variable X. Okay. So now we've got an independent variable and a dependent variable. We're going to change the um, independent variable to Z and the dependent variable to Y. Y of Z is going to be defined as little y at X. Okay, little y at X. Now, since we said X is related to Z, it's related to Z via... Um, x equals epsilon to the minus alpha times z. So I can plot plug that in for that. So in other words, I've got a new function here, which depends on z, and I'm going to call that capital Y of z. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change all my uh, derivatives to this new variable z from the, deriv from the variable x. So remember, we have dy dx. If I want to change... Um, to my new variables, I have to use the chain rule. So I'm going to change by taking dz dx, d capital Y dz, but realizing that dz dx is just equal to uh, epsilon to the alpha through this uh, through this equation. So in other words, I can directly relate the derivatives in x to the derivatives in z and in the new deep dependent variable. If I do this second derivative, and I showed you how to do this with the, um, uh, so with the, uh, with, the with the trajectory problem, right? The projectile problem. So we did the same thing, but there we were converting to a different variable for the purposes of non-dimensionalization. Here we're doing it purely for the purposes of rescaling to get a stretched variable in our inner problem. The same thing applies, though. You use a chain rule. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to just miss you saying this, um, but is this choosing of the variable in a particular to the problem that we're looking at? Okay. Yeah. Were you going to? Well, just because it, it, I've seen this kind of uh, stretching down like, you know, second order things with these where you use that one now. So I was wondering if that's coming from the truck of the problem or if there's some other reason why we've chosen it. Um, so it, it's it's coming because we want to, uh, we want a new variable, we want a new dependent variable that is not rapidly changing in this new coordinate system. In the coordinate system X, little y is rapidly changing in the inner solution region. We want to change to a new variable, the stretched variable, so that our y function, which we're going to call capital Y now, is not rapidly changing in that. So it's its values and its derivatives don't rapidly change. It could be called that, so f is small. So if you multiply, it's like stretching the x-axis so your original slope becomes like flat in this way. Uh, like for some in that Europe. sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, well, let let's let me th let me think about that. Um, I mean, if you take your your image like the the, the solution you plot, but you because you multiply by a small number, so you stretch it exactly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like That's right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, you're, we're you're, we're stretching the coordinate system so that it's instead of going like this, you know. Okay, um, so now the ODE becomes this new ODE in the variables uh, Y and Z, okay, capital Y and Z. So Y is our new uh, dependent variable and Z is our new independent variable. And how are we going to determine the values of alpha that we need? The way we're going to do this is use the method of dominant balance, the same method that we used in the algebraic equations framework in order to get solutions that um, that 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 don't lose this higher order term. Now, in the inner region, if we pick the correct stretching variable, 
what we're going to do is, and if it's that, if that's possible to correct, if it's possible to choose a correct stretching variable, then that should lead to the situation where capital Y is not rapidly varying. Okay. So that's what we're going to assume. We're going to assume that when once we pick the correct variable, that all of these functions, the function itself and all of its derivatives are order one. Okay. Now I haven't defined what I mean by order one yet. We will define that rigorously later, but it means doesn't change rapidly. Okay. But now we have to determine alpha. And the way we're going to do this is the method of dominant balance. The problem with our regular perturbation method previously was that whenever we thought about epsilon being small, we were canceling out that second derivative term altogether, right? We were saying to drop that or to, to, to consider it negligible, that would mean that epsilon times the second derivative has to be negligible. But we see in the inner region that's no longer true. The second derivative might be rapidly changing. And so the second derivative is large multiplied by a small parameter becomes an order one parameter. So it can't be neglected anymore. So we want to come up with a situation where that term stays around, doesn't get dropped off, doesn't get neglected. So the method of dominant balance is the following or the principle of dominant balance. It says that the first term should balance with another term with respect to uh, or I should say the coefficients of the first term balances with the coefficient of another term with respect to their powers of epsilon. Okay, so the coefficients of the first term and some other term should balance. That's the first part. And the second part is that these two terms, once balanced, should dominate all other terms as epsilon gets goes to zero. Okay, they should be larger than all other terms or at least most other terms. So if terms one and two balance, that means that epsilon to the one plus two alpha has to be equal to epsilon to the one plus alpha. Why is that true? Well, that's just setting this guy equal to that guy. Okay. So if their powers of epsilon are to balance the, their coefficients, then that means that these powers are equal to each other. One plus two alpha equals one plus alpha. If I solve for alpha, where's my typo at? Uh, item two should be dissatisfied. Is that what's not? This is not. Like the second bullet point. Yeah, so yeah, all of my, see, uh, option two. I think we have to have one of them being true. <laughs> so let's make sure. So option two, F, alpha. Okay, we'll, we'll check it. We'll check it. Okay, so one and two balance. So that's this guy. Yeah, they can't all be wrong, right? <laughs> uh, so this equals that. What does that say? That says that alpha has to be equal to zero so that we get epsilon to the one, epsilon to the one, okay? Now, if that's epsilon to the one, what are the other powers of epsilon? Okay, so the other powers, so epsilon would have to be able to dominate. So what did I say alpha was equal to in that first case? It's equal to zero. So this is epsilon to the zero. That's an order one term. Epsilon to the zero, that just means one. And of course, I've got a one here as well. So if this is really epsilon and epsilon, does that dominate, or sorry, this is uh, epsilon to the one. This is epsilon to the one. This is gonna be epsilon zero, that's order one. And this is order one. Does epsilon really dominate order one as epsilon gets small? No. Order one dominates epsilon. It's the, it's the opposite. So that one's not a possibility. And I did get one thing right. So this one's not a possibility. So we cancel that off the list. Suppose terms one and three balance. In this case, I'm claiming that epsilon has to be equal to minus one. Let's see, is that true? So I have to take, uh, that would mean that one plus two alpha 
equals alpha, right? Because that would be the coefficients of one and three. So if we solve for that uh, alpha, so that would be uh, one equals minus alpha, or let's say alpha equals minus one, right? So if alpha equals minus one, then what does that mean that this is equal to here? So this is going to be one minus two, right? One minus two, so that's minus one. Epsilon to the minus one power, epsilon to the minus one power. What is this guy? Epsilon to the zero, that's order one. And this is always order one. That one works because epsilon to the minus one dominates um, dominates epsilon to zero. So this one does satisfy dom dominant balance. Yeah, I meant to say does. Okay, so this one works. One of them has to work. <laughs> Or else we're in trouble. Is it possible that it might be nothing? Else? Yes, it's possible. In that case, it might mean you're choosing the wrong type of scaling or the wrong assumptions about scaling. So you're cho we're choosing a scaling which is epsilon to some power. Maybe you have to choose a scaling which has log of epsilon or something like that, something ex more exotic. So if something doesn't work, it means you have to back up and try again, try something new. Okay, and I think one and four, if, if we choose those to balance, I claim that you get alpha equals a minus a half coming out, and but that doesn't work. That that in that case, we can't balance, we can't dominate the middle two terms. Okay, so I'll I'll assume that you can check that. So we're going to use option two. So alpha is equal to minus one in option two. Remember we said that Z is equal to epsilon to the alpha times X. So that means that we have the variable, the stretch variable uh, X over epsilon. That's interesting because do you remember our solution had an X over epsilon in it, right? It had an X over epsilon in it. Now, if we do that substitution, alpha equals minus one, then our equation transforms like this. Now, this is fine. I can keep that, but multiplying by, through by a power of epsilon or multiplying through by a constant, even if it involves epsilon, doesn't change the problem at this, this point. That was the same. The same was true whenever we were dealing with the algebraic system of equations. Uh, the problem, the real problem was, or that you, you actually changed the problem by changing variables not by multiplying by constants, okay? So I can clear this constant out of here by multiplying through by epsilon every term, and it doesn't change the problem uh, one iota. So this is the new problem that I get and the new balance that I get. So notice that this problem, um, the one that's gonna apply in the inner region is a, is a second order problem. So this might be a, a cause for concern for us, right? Because if we're really working in the inner region, we're only going to have one boundary condition in, at that boundary layer point, x equals zero. We know that if we solve a problem like this, we should have two independent solutions with two degrees of freedom. How are we going to get that second degree of freedom if we only have one boundary condition? Well, we'll address that momentarily, but let's take care of the first problem first. Now we can put a regular perturbation assumption or use a regular perturbation ansatz for our solution into the differential equation and do what we usually do, solve term for a term. The difference between this and the algebraic equation uh, problem was, or the problem with the algebraic equation is, here we have an inner and outer solution, whereas with the algebraic problem, we really only had the inner problem. We had to, whenever we had the singular perturbation uh, case happening, epsilon multiplying the highest order term, we had to do a change of variables and that, that was it. Once we determined what the right change of variables were, were, we were done, we plugged in our regular perturbation onsots and we solved the problem and then we converted back. Here, we're gonna have two different uh, regimes. 
in some real life problems, you can have three different regimes. You can have uh, an inner solution and you can have two different outer solutions. Okay. You can have really wild things happening. So this is kind of like the simplest of all the bad problems you can face. So we've now determined the, the structure of the inner problem. We're going to put a regular perturbation uh, approximation in for the true solution and then solve for terms. The question again arises, why do we use epsilon? The reason we're going to use epsilon here mainly has to do with the fact that our inner variable has the this structure for the stretch parameter or the inner solution uses this parameter. If it had been epsilon to the one half power, you might considering using uh, an expansion on Zots, which is in powers of epsilon to the one half power. You just have to try different things and, and search C pattern what works. Now, um, so let's plug this into the inner equation and get a system of equations, namely y zero double prime plus y zero prime equals zero for our leading order. Again, this is what we call leading order. And the next one is called the first order correction. And that has this structure. First order correction, second order correction, and so on. Notice that the structure of the equations, and this is primarily because we're dealing with linear equations, stays the same. It's kind of invariant. Once I determine this one, then they're all the same all the way down. Yeah. Should those be Zs the, uh, on uh, the last? Yes, they the should be. Yeah. I'm Xing them out. That's probably not the right thing to do. How about this? Z. Okay. I think that's okay after that. You're going to actually use the y positive. Oh, nice. Yeah, but then I'll forget to change it. I need to remember. I need to go back in the notes and change it. Okay, so but the, the structure of these equations become invariant. Uh, the only thing that's changing is the k, right? So I could replace this with k and k minus 1, and it stays the same. Okay, what about uh, initial conditions or boundary conditions? So the boundary conditions, we're only going to use the left-hand boundary condition in the boundary layer, the one at x equals zero. So what, by the way, what is the boundary layer and where is it located? So we're kind of looking at a boundary layer like here. So boundary layer. And out here is one. So we're viewing this as being the still the left-hand endpoint in our boundary layer. And our boundary layer is going to be thin. Of course, now we've stretched that boundary layer out, right? Because we've made, we've used the stretch variable. So this boundary layer for fixed chosen epsilons, this guy now is no longer in the in the in the z variable. This is no longer small. It could be quite large, right? In any case, we transform our boundary conditions the same way we did before. This case, they're all zeros, right? So it's zero plus zero times epsilon plus zero times epsilon squared. And so we can equate and get uh, in this expansion, y zero at zero has to be zero, y one at zero has to be zero, and so on. They're all the same. The general leading order solution is, or the general solution leading order problem, I should say, is this, um, is this expansion. That's because if you put in, so do you guys remember how to solve these types of problems? You you put in a guess for this, e to the r times x, and then you figure out, well, what does r have to be? Well, r turns out to be, it's either minus one, yeah, minus one and zero. So that means you have minus one and zero means you just have a one there. So let's use our boundary condition to determine if possible any of the uh, free coefficients. So if I plug in uh, z equals zero, I get zero equals the sum of these two. So both have to be 
um, of the same magnitude, but equal or opposite in sign, right? Equal in magnitude, opposite in sign. So that says that really I only have one coefficient or one parameter, one free parameter. And so I can rewrite the solution like this. I'm going to call that free parameter A. Well, now I, now I could, I, I, I could go on. And in chapter two, we're going to show how to go on to get the next order and the next order and the next order and the next order. What we'll find is that working any harder on this problem is futile because the, the leading order problem gives us everything we need, okay? It gives us the best possible approximation that we can expect to get. But we're far from understanding why that's the case. Uh, and so now let's just deal with little y0 and capital Y0 in inner solution and an outer solution and think about how to marry the two things. Notice what we have going for us. The outer solution has no free parameters associated to it. That was e to the one minus x. The inner solution has a free parameter associated to it. So how could I figure out what that free parameter is? Well, I could try to marry those two solutions up somewhere in this sort of in-between land, somewhere here in the middle where we're outside of the boundary layer. Maybe we're kind of outside of the realm of validity for the outer problem, somewhere in what we call an intermediate range or intermediate variable range. We're going to discuss the simplest possibility for marrying these two things, and this is what is called matching. So we have to come up with a matching principle which marries the inner solution and the outer solution together to get a composite approximation over the entire um, the, the entire domain. <clears throat> so then once we determined this free parameter A, we could go back then and if we wanted to, we could determine the next uh, correction, the y, y1 terms, et cetera. But let's start here. So our simple matching principle is going to be this. We're going to assume that as z goes to infinity for our inner approximation y0z, that should be equal to as a limit the limit as this should be x going to 0. That should be x. x goes to zero of the outer solution as x gets, as x approaches zero from the right. Okay. So that's what I'm going to use to denote approaching zero from the right. I'm going to use this kind of notation. This means it gets smaller, but it always stays, uh, uh, it always stays to the right of zero. In general, when you write something like this, x goes to zero, it could go to zero uh, by bouncing on either side of zero. So it could be positive or negative. Oftentimes, an expression like this also means that x is going to zero monotonically, okay? It doesn't have to, but it usually does. It means it's monotonically getting smaller and smaller until it reaches zero in a sort of limit. So that's how we're going to match these two solutions. We're going to assume that if you take the outer solution and send x equal to zero, not z, x equal to zero, then that should match with taking the inner solution and sending z to infinity, positive infinity. Okay. And I'm going to use this notation for going up to infinity z. You don't have to uh, necessarily because z really can't be on the right or left-hand side of infinity, so there's no real... So it usually just means that z is monotonically approaching infinity. It's getting larger and larger, and it's never getting smaller. It's just always getting larger. All right, so if I do that, if I, in the inner solution, I take z to um, positive infinity, then I just get a. The reason is because as z goes to infinity, this guy here becomes exponentially small, right? And exponentially small terms are usually uh, negligible in this course, okay? In fact, we'll come up with a special name for such things. So this getting exponentially small in the limit, it goes to zero. 
So all that's retained is A. This guy, as X approaches zero, is just going to give me E to the one, okay? 2.718281828, and I don't remember it after that, okay? So E to the one. So A is equal to E to the one. If that's the case, then we fully have determined, we ha or we have fully determined the inner solution, okay? Now we could go back and do Y1, but it turns out figuring out what Y1 is determines a more sophisticated matching because we're gonna to have to match that to little Y of one somehow. So more sophisticated matching is gonna to have to wait until chapter two. Well, now um, we can form our composite solution. And the way we do a composite solution is pretty simple, actually. You simply take the inner solution and you're going to add that to the outer solution. But then you have to subtract. A, so, so now you've got some double counting in the overlap region. And the double counting is however these things match in this in the in the sense that we've matched them so far we'll get into this in more detail in chapter 2 but for right now it turns out that all we have to do when we take care of matching terms is just this limit value here so we have to subtract away a or in other words we have to subtract away e to the first power so here's our composite solution now, why did I write this as X over epsilon? Well, we had the inner solution in terms of Z, but we can always convert from Z to X and uh, you know, in a, in a very straightforward way because Z is equal to X over epsilon. So you can just do a straightforward replacement there. And it makes sense that we want to write in one single unified variable. So there's my inner solution, outer solution, subtract off matching terms. So we have inner solution plus the outer solution, subtracting off any uh, matching terms. So this is just the limit, the, the common limit as Z goes up to infinity for the outer solution and X goes to zero for the outer solution. Did I say that right? Z goes to infinity for the inner and X goes to zero for the outer, that common limit. Now you can do some simplification, simple algebra, and you'll get this as your composite solution, what we call the leading order composite. So leading or composite C, leading order zero, that's our leading order composite solution. Now it turns out if you try to produce a composite solution of order one, that means you have the leading order plus correction, you get exactly the same thing. And if you try to add in the second order correction, you get exactly the same thing. And if you try to add the third, you get exactly the same thing. So in other words, this is the best you can do, okay? You can't improve upon this, okay? Now you might think that sucks because that doesn't look like the true solution. And I was hoping as epsilon goes, or you know, I was hoping to, as I add more and more terms to my expansion, I must be getting, I must in the limit, get my composite solution as this number goes to infinity getting exactly the same well that's where asymptotic analysis um, doesn't always live up to your high expectations it's a limited tool a limited resource in this case the best i can all ever do is an asymptotic approximation of this it is uniformly valid over the whole interval but notice that I'm not getting the exact solution in the limit, keeping in mind that taking this to in, taking this number to infinity never improves that. It's always the same. Now, it is still remarkably close to the exact solution, right? What and, and you have to ask yourself, well, what am I missing? So the top is the same as the top, or the numerator is the same as the numerator of the true solution. The only difference is the denominator is missing this term. As epsilon gets smaller and smaller, however, this term is exponentially small. 
we're it's we run into exponentially small terms so often that we give them a special name. They're called transcendentally small terms. And asymptotic analysis in the standard setting can never really respond or mimic or capture transcendentally small terms. There's a new version of asymptotic analysis called asymptotic analysis to all orders, which can capture transcendental term, transcendentally small terms. But that's such a hard theory and goes, you know, and involves, involves so much more machinery that it's not necessarily worth it. And I'll show you why. I'll show you why. So you might think, well, you know, that looks okay, except for it's missing this term, and I'm really bummed out about that. But as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, this is a transcendentally small term. Let's see, maybe we're not doing so badly. So here's some plots of my composite approximation versus the true solution. Remember, I have a true solution for various uh, choices of epsilon. So let's take the larger epsilon first. That's this one here, these two, the blue and the orange curve. A nice UT orange, I guess. So they're not exactly laying on top of each other. There's a difference that you can see, right? I still match the boundary condition over here. What you notice is, and what you can show is that the composite solution always gets this boundary condition correct. What it doesn't do correctly is it never gets this boundary condition exactly correct. It's never exact. Even though here, it looks like they're overlapping, they're not quite. So you can show that the composite solution in this particular case always gets that boundary condition exact, and it's off by a small amount over here. In fact, it's off by a transcendentally small term. As epsilon gets smaller, let's take these two, epsilon 0 0.1, which is not a very small value of epsilon. You can see that these two curves are identical to the naked eye. They overlap. Okay, these two, uh, sorry, um, these two, yeah. So the red is overlaying the green curve. You can't even see the green curve. It's there, I promise you, but they're overlapping. This plot is not that friendly to color plot. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, uh, that means I'm going to have to enlist you to help me improve my plots, right? You know how to do MATLAB code or uh, Mathematica code? So... You you just you just nominated yourself. <laughs> That's a good point. Okay, so uh, that does anyone else suffer with um, difficulty distinguishing colors? Okay, so uh, we'll try to fix the plots so that you guys can uh, can participate. I may have a combination of colors and then dashed lines and things like that. So we don't want to discriminate against anyone. All right. Well, that's kind of the, the main story with that linear boundary layer uh, theory. Okay. We're going to, that's going to be the subject of a lot of discussion in chapter, chapter four, actually. And if you look at chapter four right now, there's like two words in chapter four, and that's yet to be typed. Uh, so it's uh, it's all in here right now, and I'll be furiously typing over the next few weeks. So that chapter is going to explode exponentially. Uh, and so so be on the lookout for that. Again, just keep in mind this dot that lecture notes document is going to change quite a bit. Let's move on to a singular perturbation problem of nonlinear type, and I'll show you how much harder these problems are, or can be. So let's consider the following two-point boundary value problem. Minus epsilon squared du dx squared plus u cubed x minus u of x equals zero. This looks like a hard problem. U of minus one is equal to minus one, and U of one is equal to one. Now, the big problem with this is that this is no longer a linear equation, and this term here contributes a lot of pain to our otherwise happy existence. Epsilon is 
a positive number, and we're going to consider that to be a small parameter as usual. This model describes the uh, transition of an order parameter in statistical mechanics or thermodynamics from one pure phase characterized by the state u equals minus one to another pure phase characterized by the state u equals plus one. What I mean by that is the solutions for this problem are going to look like if I plot them <clears throat> on x. So basically, uh, let's see. Oh, no, I need to do. So here's my minus one. Here's my plus one. And so solutions are going to look like this. As epsilon gets smaller and smaller, the solution is going to become more like this. Okay. The transition region is going to get smaller and smaller. So it's going to dictate what's called a boundary layer again. But the weird part about this one is this boundary layer is going to sit right in the middle of our domain, not at the edges. Okay. So we're going to have to deal with this uh, this uh, this problem by constructing an inner uh, solution somewhere near x equals zero, and then we'll have two outer regions. Okay. Now the nice thing about this problem is, or the hard thing is, it's nonlinear. But the nice thing is, we can actually construct solutions to this, and we have a really good idea of what solutions look like. These solutions are what are called diffuse interface solutions. And this interface that's described by this solution is sometimes called the van der Waals con Hilliard phase boundary or the van der Waals uh, con Hilliard diffuse interface. And it comes from thermodynamics, um, material science, and uh, statistical mechanics. Now, this is a singular perturbation problem, as was the previous problem, but it has the added difficulty that it's nonlinear. When we set epsilon equal to zero, the higher order term goes away, and we're left only with an algebraic equation, not even a differential equation. Of course, we're going to neglect, or so, so this problem will probably be the problem that's going to be applied in the outer solution region, away from the boundary layer. I've already told you the boundary layer is at x equals um, x equals zero. So let's think about solving this problem. What are the solutions? Well, if we solve this problem, we've got away from the boundary layer, which which is at x equals zero. We're going to have to try to satisfy this nonlinear equation, and the solutions to this nonlinear equations are is simple. The solutions are u equals zero u equals plus one or u equals minus one. Well, in the boundary layers, it looks like we could satisfy those, but not simultaneously, right? On the one side of the interface over here, we could say, okay, looks like the outer problem is satisfying u equals minus one. So that's that guy. And in this outer layer problem, we could say u equals plus one. Notice that that's not going to be a good solution for us over the whole dom domain because you can't ever join up solutions like that. Now, this in this case, there's no possible way at all, right? I can't make minus one equals plus one. So that means something's going to happen in that boundary layer, which is going to have to correct for that. So let me show you first that this problem arises from considerations of what are called equilibrium or equilibrium considerations. That means... I'm going to try to reframe this in terms of an energy. And equilibrium happens when the energy is at its lowest possible state. Okay. Better uh, uh, for, for to, to get to equilibrium in a system, uh, usually that's characterized by the entropy being the maximum. But equivalently, whenever the temperature is constant, it's the same as making sure the free energy is at its minimum because these things differ by a minus sign. So that's that's the approach I'm going to use here. I'm going to create something called a free energy, and I'm going to try to minimize that. And I'm going to show that that minimum exactly results in the equation that you just saw. But I have to convince you of that, so you don't have to buy that right now. Okay, I'm going to be a salesman and try to sell that to you. 
So let me create something called the homogeneous free energy density. This thing I'm going to label as W of U. So this is a function of U, and I'm going to think about U as being a state describing the system. If I imagine the states just coming in these discrete increments where U is just some fixed value all across the state, then I can calculate this energy density. So if I put in U equals zero, I get a value. U equals one, I get a value. U equals plus one, I get a value. I can take the derivative of this guy and set it equal to zero, uh, and uh, or just take the derivative of it. And notice if I take the derivative of this homogeneous free energy, I get U cubed minus U. But that is exactly what I had appearing here and here. So I can rewrite this whole problem as or as a differential equation involving the derivative with respect to W. Here's the new version of the equation. Minus epsilon squared du dx squared plus W prime of U equals zero. When I look at an equation like this, I immediately think has anyone here taken calculus of variations or variational calculus? You will immediately see that this is a variational derivative set equals zero. In other words, this is what is called a stationary solution. Um, now, if you're not indoctrinated in the subtle art of uh, uh, variational calculus, then you might not see that. But I'm going to try to convince you that this is a derivative. This whole thing is a derivative set equal to zero, what's called sometimes a functional derivative. Now, this W function is what we call double well function. It's one quarter uh, U squared minus one quantity squared. And it has minima at plus one and minus one. And that's what's going to set the states to be preferred or that's what's going to set the values of the preferred states to be plus one and minus one. So this energy says, I really want the system to be at either minus one or plus one, okay? The lowest possible it could be for that state. There just so happens that there's no unique uh, minimum for that state, there's, there's two. Now I'm going to set a, or define what's called an energy space or an energy set. Let's set uh, omega to be minus one to one. And that's because I'm setting this to be um, an interval. And it's, it's in particular the interval over which my differential equation is defined. But I might want to change this later. So I'm going to give it a variable name, OK? Some notation. So let's suppose that u is in this thing we're going to, we're going to call the energy set. The energy set. How do I define the energy set? Well, I want that to be continuous functions. This is not a prime here. This should be a one. C1. So this means, this notation means it's a function which is continuous and its derivative is also continuous. Okay, its first derivative is also continuous over the domain omega. And this is a slight error here as well. There should be no second parentheses there, from omega into r. So this notation means essentially that I have a function that has a first derivative and the first derivative is continuous on this open interval omega. The other thing I want is over the closed interval, so the closure, if for those of you who aren't math mathematicians, so if this is equal to the open interval minus one to one, then the closed interval or the closure is just the interval minus one to one, including the endpoints. Okay, so that's what this notation here means. Okay, this means that I have a continuous function over the closed interval into R. This is so that you can give that function boundary conditions. Okay, so it has a first derivative, and it's a globally continuous function over the closed domain. And then I want to specify for the energy set that the boundary conditions are always defined as u at minus one equals minus one and u at plus one equals plus one, okay? For all such functions in the energy set, I can put them in this thing I'm gonna call the energy. 
and I can calculate an energy for that. Now, actually, you could do that for any, any anything in this set that even has different uh, endpoints, okay, or different boundary conditions. But the problem that I'm going to state has this boundary condition, and so that's why I want that to be part of my energy set definition. So I defined this thing. This is called the free energy density or the homogeneous free energy density. And this energy is kind of an interesting one. We won't get, we won't have time to go into it in depth, but we will next time. This is going to penalize any gradients in the system. So if a solution or a function or a state has a gradient in the system, like it does in this region here, this part of the energy is going to penalize that. This part of the energy is going to penalize parts of the solution which are away from what it desires. What are the desires of W? W wants the system to be in the states minus one and plus one. And the gradient doesn't like, and the gradient energy doesn't like gradients. So the competition of these two energies is what's going to produce the solution that I wrote before. But I still have to convince you of that through a long-winded calculation. So we'll pick up there next time. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come up afterward or shoot me an email. Uh, if you guys that uh, are watching online have a question, you can submit that via chat. If not, I'll see you guys on Thursday.